largest 1,200 megawatts, full 600 employees, 12 generators. This is 500 megawatts, uh, 30 employees, oh. and it's now big with two employees. So, uh, when can we go on? Oh, I'd love to. I, it's a great. I've been on a tour. And it's, a, oh, it's a great place. Uh, kind of thing I used to sneak into. Uh, well, until somebody died before I had white hair. Years ago. No, no. <laughs> yeah. It is an excellent tour. Thank you for your What? Thanks. No, no, yeah. no news on this, right? Eh? Uh, no. From right now, it's not much is going to be happening with it, except to keep filming and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Plan. And. Wait, I think I let two meters go through. Did you see any at all? <laughs> and they want to naturalize this land to make it into a forest. So uh, I'm just going to tour you through this quickly and then send you off to the power generation end of it. So uh, you guys have a look? Old construction. Well, it's dumped. This was fill, right? This was Lake Ontario at one time. Now it's fill. So there's a bit of coal mixed in here, obviously, because of the rubber. So we're just trying to suppress that down and then create layers of uh, humus. And to do that, you have to plant plant material and to create biodiversity. So we have lowlands with wetland plants, uplands with dryland plants, logs to decompose and bring in bugs. And then, you know, hopefully we can just, this place will be self-sustaining in 25, 30 years. Uh, this is just a test plot we've done. The initiative is for the whole property, actually. So um, this is it. Uh, you have any questions? Yeah. Big time. Well, that's why we have these huge tanks here. That are full of, that's 2,000 liters of water. And, uh, Graham, that. Okay. We need three years to get this stuff going, and then we just are going to let it go. Whatever dies, dies. Whatever lives, lives. We're just we're trying to create a, you know, something that's uh, going to last here forever. And the trees, like eventually we'll plant, we'll start interplanting with natives, like the real uh, natives like oaks and uh, sugar maples. Right now we have native trees, but that are hardy to, uh, you know, tolerable. It is a big tree, yeah, but it does well with herb. Yeah, you know, it is definitely good. Yeah, you'll love it. Uh, they also have beehives over there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It's to the city of Toronto, so we're not very far. But it doesn't go all the time. We don't run all the time. We're what's called the peaking plan, which really means that we run when electricity is really needed. Um, but there's a governing body called the ISO that helps to turn us on and turn us off. We put offers in to, to maintain, to, to run if we want to. Ironically, I said we're a peaking plan, so on the weekends, Typically, wouldn't think we'd be running because people don't use as much electricity. But there's times that we do because power plants have to sporadically, periodically shut down just to do some maintenance. So they typically pick a non-busy time, which is the weekend. But by them being down, it becomes a busy time for us, time, us guys. But that's that's fine. For us, it's it, it's good. And we're what's called a combined site because we have two jet engines, which really produce the electricity. And then there would be lots of wasted heat if the engines just spit it out. So we have a third uh, turbine, which is a steam generator. So based on that waste heat, all that heat gets recycled. So instead of having the sacks have over 600 Celsius of uh, temperature coming out, it's around 80 after all this heat gets recycled. Yeah. So that just makes it much more efficient. It's called combined cycle of electricity um, using uh, coal. We use natural gas, we produce around 550. They had 600 employees, we have 27. So their parking lot was all that area for the 600. And this was where all the coal was stored. So they had to transport the coal over to there. Ours is natural gas, you can't, can't see it, it's in a pipeline. And our parking is have two spots, so it's, it's one of those things. The scale is a lot different. It's a lot more efficient. And part of the reason that we don't need as many people is because the equipment is a lot more computerized. So lots of our pieces of equipment have sensors that feed back to the control room. And they can push a button and it can send signals back and forth. So sometimes that doesn't work, so that has to get fixed. But in the old days, they had radios where they would have to communicate back, turn this valve on, turn it off. So it's, it's one of those things, things have changed.
changed over the years. Um, and we're, we're half owned by uh, OPG and TransCanada Pipelines. But we're, we're a separate entity. Um, so that looks like an ideal place for it's an ideal place for, the, I haven't been inside to see it, so for the, that would be nice for doors open over there. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's more industrial. Yeah. And we've probably seen it in movies, but we don't realize it. Yeah. Um, but around this area too, because of that industrial nature, I've yeah. seen Rookie Blue, where they had an episode where there was a car that was there. Oh, yeah, and yeah. It's kind of funny when you see something and they make it, yeah. this is up up north and all that. It's like, no, it's not. This it is Toronto, 50, 60, 70 years old. They're actually building a new one, which is yeah. going to be a lot smaller. Yeah. 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 Um, but one of the reasons that we're a great plant for the city is because we're so close. Yeah. So when we're needed, we can turn on fairly quickly. Yeah. And we have had times where we were needed. Mm -hmm where there was a transformer explosion by the yeah. airport, yeah. and we got turned on. Yeah. So we do help that for liability. The reason that reliability is such important is because of that big, big blackout. Yeah, I know. So it's one of those... <laughs> that was horrendous. <laughs> exactly. So that's why the government sort of wants power plants to be there. Natural gas plants are easier and quicker to build, and they're, they're quicker to turn on versus yeah. the coal plant. Cleaner. And cleaner. The amount of pollution that we produce is is, is almost nothing compared to the compared to that. How long does it take to turn it on from when someone decides to? It it, it, it varies. It could be within an hour. Yeah. And part of it is because of the combined cycle. If we just had the jet engines, it would be on in ten minutes. Yeah. So there are some peaking peaking plants where the governing body called the ISO can have plant, plants turned on within five minutes. And the reason that they would do that is because electricity can't be stored. Yeah. It can be stored in batteries, yeah. but as you're using it, it has to be produced. It's yeah. a weird commodity. Unlike yeah. gas for our car, we can fill it up and then it, it yeah. comes. It's stored there and you can yeah. So, so the so the ISO can do certain. They have to always balance that. Yeah. If they don't balance it, too much electricity can break things. Yeah. Too little can break things. Yeah. So they're able to do some things to maneuver. Part of the maneuvering is to use hydro plants. Because hydro plants can store electricity. I said yeah. you can't, but they can store it because they have dams. Yeah. So they can control how much is flowing. And they also, with us, if we're running, we're not necessarily running at the maximum amount. We're can be running at a minimum amount, and they do, every five minutes they tell us how much to produce. So it's a scalable yeah. thing, unlike yeah. a nuclear plant, yeah. where it's called base load. Yeah. They turn on, they produce, that's it. Yeah. But uh, so I'm sure we're all set for a tour. So by all means, on the way out.
this will max out. It depends on the steam turbine, sorry, the gas turbine load. It'll kind of follow with that, but it'll max out at 230 megawatts. Uh, the steam runs through the, uh, the steam turbine, gives up its energy in the rotation of the blades, and uh, it exits, the steam exits, and we condense it. And uh, some of you already noticed the big uh, cooling water pipes that we have. So we take water from uh, one side of the plant in the turning basin, put it through the condenser, condense the steam, and put it out into the lake. We fill up a uh, kettle in the size to make holes in an hour. Just to give you an idea of the amount of water. I need my cheat sheet. See right now we're in the middle of a uh, steam turbine outage, a bit of a forced outage. We have a uh, generator rotor that's in a shop in Richmond, Virginia right now. It weighs about uh, 60 tons. And when we pulled it, it got pulled through with a, a palm crane out of the side of the building. So all, all of this is, uh, we'll go back together when we get our uh, generator rotor back. Yeah, I'm making excuses for our housing. showing you the major pieces of equipment but you can see we uh, store lifting beams for when we have to disassemble the equipment there's auxiliary plant equipment for auxiliary steam and cooling water makeup water things like that so what we have here is uh, one of the two uh, combined or sorry uh, combustion turbine generators uh, you can see the GE generator contains hydrogen gas, so that's a hydrogen cooled electrical generator, and it's powered by the uh, combustion gas turbine, which is also a GE, it's an industrial 7FA unit. Uh, that's essentially the generator, there's not an enclosure on that per se, but the gas turbine is sitting inside of this uh, gray cabinet, and uh, you can see there's a uh, compressor section, we take outside air, we filter it. There's a filter house that takes air from outside. And we compress it, and then we uh, fire it with natural gas. Uh, firing temperature is up to 3600 degrees Fahrenheit, so quite hot. And then it runs through a turbine section, and it's the turbine section that provides the uh, rotational force to turn the generator produce the electricity. This is all exhaust and we put that through the heat recovery steam generator, which we'll see next. The hydrogen cooling system, is that common for generators? Is that a fairly new technology? It's not new. Um, the steam turbine is uh, air-cooled. And it's unusual to have one of that size air-cooled. Uh, the hydrogen gas is a much better cooling medium. And so for uh, higher megawatt units like this one, they're generally hydrogen. Transformers are oil cooled? Yeah. Uh, but I'm aware of any generators that would be oil cooled. No, because you have the rotation. how the gas turbine works. This is the, uh, the rotor turning part of the machine. And we, uh, we, we um, of course it's inside of a casing. And we can compress the air, the outside air, through this compressor section. You can see that the blades are smaller and smaller. It's just compressing the air tighter and tighter. 
generally uh, gas turbines, it's about a 16 to 1 ratio. Um, then we uh, fire natural gas and expand it through this uh, turbine section. Here's a better close up of the, the actual turbine section. It's a uh, it's very impressive environment, very hot. We cycle it so there's thermal and cycling fatigue on the unit. And uh, we change out these blades on a start basis. Normally for equipment it's so many operating hours. Uh, but we cycle these so much it's generally uh, comes out of service on a cycling basis. How many starts? Uh, for example, we just did uh, one of our gas turbines, a hot gas path inspection. That required a lot of change out of these uh, blades that we see here. And that would be about a $10 million cost. That's $2 million average households in a week. And at one hour, it's enough to operate 933 barbecues. pressure, heat recovery, steam generator. Um, uh, there's several sections of tubes in the uh, heat recovery steam generator. And essentially there's the economizer section where we warm up the water, the evaporating section where we, uh, where we uh, boil it, where we have saturated steam. And then we put it through another section where it becomes superheated steam. Uh, we increase the energy even further. And at that point, it can go into the, uh, the steam turbine. The, uh, the hottest uh, steam that we have that comes from the Hersey is called 560 degrees Celsius. So, so very hot. It's, uh, uh, it's about uh, 5,000 kPa max pressure. So you can see, uh, this shows what the top of the drums, or the top of the hearse seats look like. There's drums on top, and it's about 10 stories up. No elevator, stairs all the way up and down. Yeah, we can't go there. Can't go there. Ah, okay. Right? Uh, So you see uh, feed water pumps, low down tanks for startup. We have a uh, wood tank for startup. When, when we start up the system when it's cold, even if the steam is really hot, it's going to condense in the pipes. Yeah. And we don't want any moisture in our steam. So we open up drains and we no pull it down. No moisture in your steam. That's correct, yeah. What, what does that steam. mean? Because you want condensation in line. Condensation. You don't want, okay, so you want it all steam. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, uh, it'll erode the piping and it, it's also uh, dangerous with the steam turbine to have wet steam going in there. Because it expands. Uh, it's um, it can damage the blading, you know, just from from impact having uh, wet steam. Yeah. Wet steam, that, that, that's such a contradiction. Uh, well, in so a true water droplet, yeah. if it's mist, it's fine. Yeah. But if it's a it's droplet, droplet and it hits, hits something, something. Yeah. yeah, that's what you call wet steam. Yeah. yeah. That's NOx, that's uh, oxides of nitrogen from the uh, high temperature. And uh, so we have uh, Drylo NOx technology that uh, controls the, uh, the flame temperature and uh, we avoid NOx. We produce it in the under uh, 10 ppb 
when we're at full load. But you will notice during startup, where we don't have that uh, NOx control, there is a bit of a, a tinge. Quite noticeable on a, uh, a day where you have uh, a white background. It's quite quiet. Unnerving, it seems like steam. Sure. But it is steam. Yeah. Those two are three feet apart. Those two are three feet apart. In water, there's a lot of impurities, even the drinking water you drink, right? If you if you look at the bottom of your kettle, your scale, your iron, and so you can imagine with the water flow that we have going through our heat recovery steam generators, if it wasn't very pure water, that you would end up with a lot of problems with scale, uh, both on your uh, heating services and your hearsing, as well as the steam turbine. And, uh, there's also uh, small PPB concentrations of uh, certain water chemicals that will cause damage to steam turbine blades over time, especially on a cycling operation. Sulfides, chlorides, you get into trouble with uh, stress corrosion cracking on uh, turbine blades and whatnot. So this is a very critical part of the operation and making sure that the, uh, the water that we feed into our unit is uh, essentially H2O. We'll also add some uh, chemical treatment to it after that. But coming out of here, it's H2O. Um, the, the room in the back, we do a lot of uh, lab analysis. You guys will do their own analysis. And anything uh, that's critical, there's also online analysis that's fed up to the control room, monitored, alarm set points on it. So how are you cleaning the water? Like, it, it's not simple. Uh, it goes through uh, filters and then reverse osmosis units and then demineralizer units. So and after the demineralizers, it's exchanging any cations for hydrogen, any anions for hydroxide, so you end up with H2O. How do you dispose of all the contaminants that are in your water? Uh, it's not uh, contaminants per se, right? Like it's just, it's, uh, it's normal drinking water and it's just goes uh, constituents that you know, we don't want in. So they just get popped into the normal drink too. price in for producing electricity. So we have a team of uh, energy managers who are in charge of just that. Uh, 
20 years of uh, trouble-free operation with this. We expect it, anyway. is the Portland's Energy Center here on Unwind Drive in the Portland's. It's fascinating. Doors open 2012, doors open Toronto.